Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Wilda Nilsestoon from Bethel's Caring for Creation team, sitting in for Todd Fansler as your host this evening. Ashley Becker is our technical facilitator. This is one in many of Caring for Creation's forums and webinars where we explore together the many ways our lives are impacted by our natural environment. Over time, we have especially considered the many ways climate change has and will affect our health, our economy, society, and livability on this planet. Tonight, we're going to focus on a noteworthy and much valued local example of how we can connect with and be nurtured by nature, the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. Dr. Gisela Kutzbach is our honored speaker. We will get to that in just a minute, but first let me tell you that you are encouraged to participate in the discussion um, of this webinar uh, by placing your comments or questions in the chat function of the Zoom, and we will get our speaker's responses after her presentation. You may enter questions at any time during or after the presentation. There is likely a chat button at the bottom center of your laptop screen, or perhaps in the right hand upper right hand corner of your screen if you're using an iPad. To comment, please click the button that makes your comment visible to all panelists and participants and then click enter so that it actually goes into the chat. This session is being recorded for those not able to join us tonight or if you want to see it again. You can find it in a day or two and also any past C4C webinars by going to Bethel's YouTube page. <clears throat> Ashley, Ashley will put that link in the chat for you later. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker. It is very fitting Gisela Kutzbach should speak to us tonight. She's a co-founder of Caring for Creation. She's a longtime leader in raising Bethel's consciousness about the primary influence and impact the natural world has on the quality of our lives, our food, our health, our climate, our survivability. She has helped us to acknowledge our common responsibility to honor and sustain, sustain God's gift of creation to all. Gisela's awareness of the conflicting needs between preserving natural places and access to them in urban areas started in her childhood in Berlin, Germany, which was then a crowded walled-in city. Dr. Kutzbach has a BS in meteorology from the Free University of Berlin and a master's in meteorology and a PhD in the history of science from the University of Wisconsin. She's, she is Professor Emerita in the College of Engineering and also directed its technical communication program. But her association with the university and with the preserve started long before that as a grad student walking the lakeshore path on her way to campus. Gisela, like her much esteemed now deceased husband, John Kutzbach, is a beloved member of the Bethel community, as well as an able scientist and spokesperson and advocate for conservation and environmental justice. One third of the UW Madison campus is devoted to the preserve, from the Memorial Union to Picnic Point, spanned by the famous lakeshore path. The creation and preservation of this tribute to nature did not happen by accident or serendipity. It reflects the values of the community and that of the many volunteers who built and carry on its legacy, the legacy of this gift to the community. Gisela will explain the compelling draw this natural oasis provides, provides the campus, its students, faculty, research efforts, and the community and the meaningful role it has played in her family's life and that of so many others. It is a real honor and pleasure to welcome Gisela to the C4C platform tonight. Gisela. Thank you so much, Wilda. This was a beautiful introduction and I feel honored. So I, before I start and before I disappear into the upper corner as a little figure, <laughs> while my presentation goes on on PowerPoint, I would just like to say a little bit more about myself. When I arrived in Madison many years ago, I met John that first month 
And during that first year still, we traveled back to Berlin and were married. Then we moved into university houses, which was really bordering the preserve. So naturally we love to learn, uh, love the preserve. We carried our babies in backpacks to the preserve and later our grandchildren. And almost every Sunday afternoon saw us in the woods and in the hidden little sand beaches. And later in retirement, we walked longer walks to the Bioco Prairie and all the way from Shorewood to uh, the Memorial Union at the lake. And we had an ice cream cone there. And then we had to walk back again. So when our children and grandchildren visit us today, they still want to run to Picnic Point and they often do before sunrise, uh, by, uh, by sunrise before breakfast. So the preserve has given our family a sense of place, a place we call home. So it is no wonder that in my retirement, I became active with the friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve, doing lots of volunteer work and also serving as president for three years. So today, this focus is on the preserve. When I talk about friends, I mean the friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve, a nonprofit organization, community-based, advocating for the community and the preserve, and uh, uh, working with the preserve staff. When I talk about the preserve, I often mean uh, the preserve management and uh, the preserve lands itself. So now I will go to that PowerPoint that I talked about, and hopefully I can make it all work. So can, I think you can see this right now, is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. So, uh, so here you see Bethel at the Memorial Union picnic point and uh, the preserve stretches from the Memorial Union all the way on this green shore and further than the picture on the lower right hand side. So one third of the property of the University of Wisconsin as Wilder said. In the middle you see a, tri a rectangle which is an old agricultural field. So these uh, areas were used in many different ways over the over time, and we'll go a bit into that history. Uh, the this is a map which shows you a little more in words what we can see on the left and the right hand side is Muir Knoll to Willow Creek Woods to University Bay Picnic Point, and then way at the top in the north Fauci Point, all the way to Eagle Heights Woods in the west. So what will I talk about today? Uh, what is a preserve? Why should we have the preserve? How did the preserve come about? And how is the preserve managed today? So let's first have a look about how beautiful the preserve is. Here is Muir Knoll up on the hill from Memorial Union. I used to have classes there as grad student in May when everything was unfrozen not in January. And here we are at uh, Observatory Drive with a beautiful view of Picnic Point, a place to take your visitors, a place for photos, even wedding photos. Then we come uh, on Lakeshore Path towards Picnic Point, towards the entrance. And uh, that path goes all the way to university housing and student housing. And it is used all day long by students faculty and uh, walkers, runners and bikers. And uh, this is picnic point from the lake. It has been beautifully restored with a fire pit and a large area for group meetings. And it has safe access to the lake as you can see. And the willow tree dipping into the water on the left is a favorite for children. <laughs> uh, then we come to Eagle Heights Woods which is the highest point along the south shore of the lake. It was already a favorite hangout of Native Americans. And here we are on top of the heights 
under the splendid oak canopy, which has been restored. The preserve is beautiful every season. University Bay here seen from Picnic Point has a, is a wildlife sanctuary for 80 years now. And uh, during the fall, until the lake freezes, it teems with all sorts of waterfowl. It is a paradise for birders. And here you see the majestic tundra swans displaying their wingspans. And eagles fly here from the bearable hills to fish. In winter, strong north winds across the lake splash up these wondrous icicles on the limestone cliffs of Ramus Cove. In spring, and that's soon, right? <laughs> uh, when Dutchman's breaches emerge on the slopes of Eagle Heights Woods, and on a warm day, May apples shoot up. Hepatica pokes through aging, aging oak leaves and attracts the first bees. And warblers, like this golden winged warbler, return to feast on the blossoms of oak blossoms, oak trees. And small, uh, the beautiful trilliums show up and with the nesting season in May, robins swoop up amazing numbers of worms to feed their hungry nestlings. In summer, a visit to the Biocorp Prairie is a must. Here we are on top of the hills in what once were these agricultural fields we saw on that map. There's a picnic table waiting for you. And the prairie glows with riots of colors from purple to purple and to yellow. Never miss fall in the preserve. Parking at Ramos Cove takes you to this gorgeous oak and then into the heavenly tent of maples shining like the sun. Wildlife is not always idyllic in the preserve. There are lots of hungry mouths to feed and baby owls beg for food with heartbreaking howls. Raccoons peek from trees and deer hide from view. And coyotes now breed in the preserve. Beavers leave their marks, shy opossums scurry among the leaves. Leopard frogs display their handsome skins and painted turtles at Willow Creek Bridge are sunning on the logs. Now, two pairs of sandhill cranes are nesting in the preserve. This is the only campus in the US with nesting cranes. Insects are important for pollination and also for food. The Biocore Prairie is teeming with insects and for these round galls on oak branches are made by wasps. And milkweed bugs with their distinct red and black patterns are feeding on milkweed pods. And spiders display even striking, more striking patterns. The rusty patched bumblebee has been observed over many years in the preserve. This is a rare bumblebee in Wisconsin. And come and see the black swallowtail butterflies and the monarchs, of course. So why do people come to see the preserve? Well, most people come with the expectation of feeling better. Many people orient at the kiosk. In 2021, more than 160,000 visitors walked through the entrance at Picnic Point. Joggers, families, groups of friends at the fire circle at Picnic Point, photographers, nature lovers, respite and wellness seekers, granddad and grandson, painters, poets, dancers, and lovers. Many visitors come again and again, and they return to favorite places and develop a relationship. So then, why should we care about the preserve, having it here? Well, think back of your childhood experiences outdoor. Did you climb a tree? 
Did you build a fort from sticks? Did you skip stones at a lake? Did you go fishing? The preserve is a place where we can discover and reinforce our love for nature and learn more about it. So what else makes these diverse uses important? Nature is a web, like the internet, but even vaster. Everything is interconnected. Biologist David Haskell writes, the prairie, the wetlands, the forests are not a collection of entities, but a place entirely made from strands of relationships. These relationships include people as part of nature. Even if we never set a foot outside the city, we depend on nature. We depend on the nature's water cycle with clouds rising, rain falling, rivers flowing, groundwater replenishing. And like everything living, we depend on the sun shining. So that brings us to Aldo Leopold's land ethics. He says, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it, to use it with love and respect. Aldo Leopold was professor of wildlife management at the UW for 25 years. He had a profound impact on the environmental movement. His famous book is the Sand County Almanac. And reading from this book by the fireplace at their cabin, Sigrid and David Knudy and John and I were inspired to develop the Caring for Creation program here at Bethel. So using the land with love and respect. Leopold means that we are enmeshed with the world around us. Food and water are some ways we connect with the land, but how we use the land, how use it sustainably or not, that is the question. So let us look at the center circle of this diagram, the green part. The question is, how do we commit to act sustainably? How do we see the land as a community to which we belong? The first thought might be through uh, information about nature, education, children and learn in school, learn about the life cycle of trees from seedling to sapling to oak, big oak tree again and to new seeds. We also know that monoculture of fields like corn damage the soil, invite pests, decrease biodiversity. We know a lot. Research shows that knowing more is indeed helpful to connect to the land, but it is not an effective motivator to love and care for the land. Hmm. For example, a developer of housing might well know that wetlands prevent flooding and are home to hundreds and hundreds of creatures. But still, he might push to fill in the wetlands for development of housing. So now let's look at the experiences in nature, body and mind. They connect us emotionally to the land through smell and touch, taste and sound. Like the fragrance of the flower or the texture of a leaf or the sound of waves lapping against a boat. Such bodily experiences make us feel better. They are key predictors for environmental concern. They raise awareness. We might begin to love nature. Even so, the developer may have a cabin up north and love it there. But he still might go ahead with development with a heavy heart. But he needs to make a living and a profit. So this brings us to connecting with nature, with mind, body, and spirit. And from there to add willpower. It can grow into mindfulness of the intrinsic value, value of all life. Leopold said, it is a thought that harm to nature is harm to oneself that makes us move. So if we add willpower to the mix of love and respect, 
a person may commit to action, take on responsibility to care. Aldo Leopold did that. The Friends of the Preserve do that. The Preserve Management staff does that. Bethel did that when investing in Bethel Horizons back in 1968, I believe. And you have done it at home when you replaced one of these old bulbs with an LED bulb. So this brings us to the four harmonies and the logo of caring for creation. It follows the Bethel Bible series, loving God, self, others, and environment. There is a divine spark in us and in nature. The oak tree, the deer, we all carry the spark of divine love in us. The spark of holiness may unifies the amazing diversity of existing things. Bethel Horizons programming follows the four harmonies of the Bethel Bible series. It touches mind, body, and spirit by connecting people with God's creation, experiencing wonder, sensing the beauty inherent in cliffs, in lakes, prairies, bird songs, the cycles of life. So, love of nature is a, as a prerequisite to care for it. Pastor Victoria Lewis took this to heart. She says, uh, it's covered here. <laughs> We can only uh, protect what we love and we love only. I cannot see this cord, it's covered by people here on my seat. But, but we are, uh, what we are in relationship with, I know that. So she founded what we called the Wild Church. Worship services do not need to be in a building, she says. We can connect to God right in this creation, the outdoors. The Bethel Hikers Group here knows that from experience. For over 20 years, Bethel Hikers have explored many beautiful places, and they have cherished their worship services and devotions in nature, holy places, mountaintop experiences, feeling closer to God. It is the responsibility of our generation to help our grandchildren form and our children form relationships with the land. A Sunday afternoon outing on a family field trip in the preserve with the friends can be such an experience right here in town. Finding bugs and butterflies, feeling that nature is amazing, awe-inspiring, measuring trees, catching tadpoles in a puddle. Children need to experience the emotions that come from being in nature, adventuring, touching, smelling. For adults, certain combinations of gaining knowledge and experience in nature are strong predictors of connecting with nature. Volunteer work in the field, collecting seeds, Removing invasive species like garlic mustard here. Volunteers learn by doing. Being involved with citizen science, like here working on a, with a friends on a purple mountain house or bird watching. Family traditions such as fishing, observing the habits of trout. Storytelling, poetry. Stories are effective in bringing about an emotional response they help us recall our own experience. So now we come to how were the preserved lands saved from development. 300 acres of preserve and four miles of shoreline could now well be developed residential areas or boating harbor with restaurants. All these things and more have been seriously pursued. And yet we have the preserve. There are good people out there who have taken actions following Aldo Leopold's land ethics. They worked to save these lands for future generations for us. So let's take a step back. Consider how human activity has reshaped this area. Over a thousand years ago, Native Americans had their villages around the lake. 
They valued this area for its abundance of food, waterfowl, fish, and mussels from the lake, berries and animals from the land. And they valued this land for its beauty, a holy place to which hunter-gatherers returned every summer. They left behind earthen burial mounds a thousand years old. 370 of them were around Lake Mendota, but most of them are now gone. Once settlers reached this area, the land was surveyed and then sold by the government. Native people were driven out of this area. Soon farming sprang up. Wooded land was mostly logged and prairies and grassland tilled. Notice the fields at Picnic Point, no trees, and at Fauci Point up at the north, all fields. This air photo of 1937 shows the two principal landowners about 100 years ago, Raymer and Stephen. They were, they were hay fields where we now have student housing. Recognizing the beauty of the land, wealthy citizens built the park and pleasure drive for enjoyable excursions. And there were cows at picnic point grazing. By 1962, the landscape has changed from the previous photo. Some fields gradually gave way to mixed woods. See up at Fauci Point, and also Picnic Point is much more wooded now. The U university recognized the value of the land early on. Acquisitions were completed piece by piece, and some land was gifted to the university so as to keep it undeveloped. And these are interesting stories of our own. I cannot talk about all of them here, but we will talk in more detail about the wetland in the lower middle of the photo. Uh, it says wetland there. In this 1962 photo, these wetlands had long been converted to cornfields. Picnic Point was purchased around 1940 amidst the protests of Wisconsin citizens, taxpayers. They said that students should study, not play. Well, the last piece to connect Eagle Heights Woods to Picnic Point was a gift from the Fauci family 30 years ago, that piece in the north. These campus natural areas, as they were called at the time, did not receive managed care. There was no money for that. Nature was left to do its thing so to speak. So after years of neglect, the question came up, what should the land be restored to? Which landscape? 50 years ago, 150 years ago, earlier, not an easy answer. At this point, we will discuss one instructive example that illustrates the change of, exist, of existing landscape, the class of 1918 marsh, which you see here on this photo. This wetland was once a sedge meadow separated from the lake by a sandbar. But when Tenney Park Dam raised Lake Mendota water levels, this wetland transitioned into a marsh and fundamental change came in the late 1800s. Willow Drive was built, you know, that park and pleasure drive on top of the sandbar. And now it separated the marsh from the lake. The university built draining ditches in the wetland and our TC students were staging mock battles among the sedge meadow. You see willows in the background, the willow drive with cars parked on it. In the early 1900s, the university began acquiring this marshland with the goal to establish agricultural fields. So in 1922, all 84 acres were cultivated at the university farms, mainly corn. You can see the fields on the right of Willow Drive. Fields were fertilized with manure from the university cow herd. And this is a bit funny here. Well, everything is interconnected. So there was that manure. Many pheasants and other waterfowl flocked to the university farms to pick out the undigested seeds from the cow manure. Huh. 
So at the time, Aldo Leopold was chair of the wildlife department and his students studied the pheasants at university farm. Well, the university asked Aldo Leopold to help control these pheasants and prevent damage to the farm fields. Leopold tried to convince the nearby land orders to protect surviving red foxes to control the pheasants and rodent populations to no avail. Maybe those landowners kept chickens, who knows. The university then moved the hay fields, mowed the hay fields, can you imagine? And they destroyed half of the pheasant nests. There was also trapping and shooting. But even a bigger crisis came along when the idea sprang up to transform University Bay into a yachting club harbor. Aldo Leopold mobilized the faculty and protested fiercely, successfully, still before his death in 1948. The University Bay Wildlife Refuge was extended to include the entire bay and the area was now designated as recreation area and outdoor lab for research and teaching. That also stopped the hunting and the trapping. In addition to the experiments by the agricultural department, in the early 1950s, the meteorology department, my home department, started research in the cornfields. Werner Sumi, who was instrumental in developing satellite meteorology, he's the one in the white shirt, invented instruments to determine how corn uses solar energy and water. And based on this work, he developed a radiometer to help determine the energy budget of the Earth. And this radiometer was launched into orbit in 1953 with Explorer 7. The university had joined the space effort. By the mid 1960s, the fields were no longer farmed. So let's look at this marsh area. The pumping of water to Lake Mendota had stopped. This led to another crisis. In this 1968 photo, we see that the area of the cornfields is flooded, hugely flooded. Now the university pushed to fill the marshland permanently and they began to haul building waste here. To rescue came the class of 1918. In 1968, the time the photo was taken, they celebrated their 50th anniversary and they gave $50,000 to improve this neglected former marshland. I think that's about $500,000 today. They proposed to construct a deep Japanese lagoon with islands and formal plantings. But a team of students of an environmental resource class heard about this plan and they studied the marsh issue. They concluded that the marsh was more valuable at the, as a natural wetland for wildlife and for teaching and research than a Japanese lagoon. They organized a camp in and literally lay in front of the bulldozers, environmental activism. In 1968, commitment to action. So the University Bay Committee agreed with the students and they stopped the dumping and reduced the fill in. And the class of 1918 reallocated their gift for restoration of the marsh with a trail of bridges and lookouts and benches and prairie plantings along the edges. However, there was not enough money for maintenance again. And over the years, Neglect has taken its toll. Now the marsh is overgrown with catlands, cattails devoid of life in the water. Change, change, change. To answer the question, what should we restore to? It's complicated. So let's go back to history, the 1970s now. There was essentially no active management of the preserved lands then called the campus natural areas. It was formally administered by the Arboretum. Invasive trees and buckthorn and honeysuckle bushes moved in. 
they suffocated existing vegetation and they obstructed iconic views. During the 1990s, residents of Shorewood Hills started volunteer work in the preserve area and they discovered garlic mustard. They worked with the Arboretum to organize volunteer activities in the Campus Natural Areas, or CNA, and they donated $50,000 for tools and contractors. And the Arboretum hired a part-time manager for the CNA. Then the volunteers formed a nonprofit organization, the Friends of the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. So here we have citizen commitment to action. In the year 2000, oversight of the campus natural areas was finally placed under a new university natural areas faculty committee, as separate from the Arboretum. The preserve gets its own voice. In 2004, Bill Conan, the famous environmental historian, became CNA committee chair. And his first action was to change the name of CNA to Lakeshore, which tells people pre precisely the location of the place, nature, which declares that we most value, what we most value about this place and preserve, which is a singular noun describing a unified whole. The administrative and management structure for the preserve was established with four per permanent employees. The small university group has done amazing work with limited resources. Also over the last 20 years, the Friends of the Preserve have contributed $500,000 for restoration, student summer interns and more. In these past two decades, the preserve has become the beautiful place that it is today, a story of success. An updated master plan for the preserve will be completed this year. So this is the last section of the talk. How is the preserve managed today? The vision of the University Lakeshore Nature Preserve is to foster biodiversity on campus and to cultivate lifelong environmental engagement. The updated master plan will be based on these core values and guiding principles, education and research, access, engagement, and collaboration, ecologically sound management, and respect, as in Aldo Leopold's land ethics. So many university programs use the preserve. It is an extension of the classroom and research laboratory for many classes, botany, forestry, geography, limnology, zoology, you name it. And numerous permits are given each year to faculty, students, and citizens of the community to do research. The Friends of the Preserve also support the research goals of the uh, citizens through citizen science. These projects are opportunities to learn, receive the needed training, enjoy working as a team, and connect with nature. So iNaturalist is an application that helps you identify plants, animals, insects through photos. So now you can take your photo into nature and use it. The Friends partner with Clean Lakes Alliance by taking weekly water quality measurements at University Bay. And the Friends are providing and monitoring a purple martin house and helped raise 22 nestlings last year. And they are also maintaining a bluebird trail. In addition, the Friends support the educational mission of the preserve through field trips and volunteer work. They sponsor about 30 to 40 field trips annually, attracting almost 600 people. The limited preserve staff cannot possibly provide this kind of massive outreach. Topics range from geology of the area, spring ephemerals, wildlife tracking and winter birds, and insects to edible plants, fungi, and more. They are all led by professionals. Volunteer work is another opportunity for people to connect with nature and learn about it. 
The preserve management staff engages numerous campus and community groups in volunteer work. Here the focus is on removing invasives and planting wildflowers. Another guiding principle for the preserve management is effective signage and access, and that will be significantly improved. But the preserve is easily reached by students and the community on foot, by bus, on a bike path, and there's plenty of parking. And there are maps at the entrances, as well as trail signs. And trails have been improved and maintained, are maintained. And there are fire pits for public use. Firewood is provided to discourage people from hacking down nearby saplings. Wouldn't you want to be right at that fire? The preserve extends culturally and historically informed stewardship to effigy mounds. The 13 mounds in the preserve include examples of all types of mounds found in southern Wisconsin. They are linear, conical, and animal shaped. When I came in 1964, John and I still happily stood on top of the conical mound at Picnic Point. Now this mound is fenced off from the path and planted with natural grasses, as it should be. All mounds were used to gra mark grave sites. They can contain remains of only one or two people, but also bundles of bones representing up to 60 people. In 1939, when amateur archaeologist Charles Brown and his crew began repairing mounds, they began repairing them at this group, he encountered a bundled burial fairly close to the surface of this mound that we stand on. Mounds are sacred. There is no more digging and no replacement of soil. So today we recognize the land of southern Wisconsin as the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk. The plaque on the UW campus acknowledges, acknowledges the circumstances that led to their forced removal. In a 1832 federal treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede the territory, a place their nation had called T-Job, Four Lakes. This was followed by decades of ethnic cleansing. The Ho-Chunk people were sent to camps in Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, and even South Dakota. But showing enormous resilience, the Ho-Chunk always trickled back to their ancestral land in Wisconsin, which included the area around Madison. A priority is safeguarding the mounds using vegetation management. This sequence of sli slides shows the amount of restoration work needed to save the mounds on top of Eagle Heights, the highest point at the southern shore of the lake. The mounds were overgrown with trees and buckthorn by the time restoration began in 2014. Before settlement, native people had kept the top of Eagle Heights open woodland with controlled fires. They maintained sweeping views across the lake to other sacred sites. So several mature trees now had to be removed from the three mound features. Buckthorn was cleared out immense quantities of it. Imagine the work it took. The buckthorn was chipped to cover lovely new path. And now the sun dabbles the forest floor again and grass cover protects the mound from erosion. But you still can see there's more work. Buckthorn is still looming in the background. Clearing buckthorn is an ongoing process and uh, throughout the preserve and highly labor intensive. Compare the top view and the bottom view. Clearing opens coveted views towards the lake. Once buckthorn is removed, new native understory plants are planted for birds and animal populations. The footprint of a century of agricultural use has not yet disappeared from the preserve. The top view still shows the stop view, it still shows the original straight line boundaries of the agricultural fields. So during the long period of neglect, 
the old field had become overgrown with weeds and it was in part used as stumping ground for hospital excavations and slimy lake weeds harvested from Lake Mendota. So about 20 years ago, faculty of the university biological core program decided to build a prairie in this area as an outdoor lab. Today, this field is a blazing prairie with all colors of the rainbow, home to uncountable insects and birds and mammals. Restoration of natural communities must address the problems caused by invasives, be it buckthorn or garlic mustard or insects like the emerald ash borer. An invasive is not part of the local web of natural entities and can wreak havoc with the local environment or ecosystems. Here you see 50 bags of garlic mustard gathered during one volunteer morning in 2017. It is much better today. And here is a pile of nasty motherwort. It is unavoidable, unavoidable that in an urban, urban area, invasives are distributed into the preserve you know, by visitors, by animals, and even by wind. Consider the edge effect. When driving on rural Wisconsin roads, we can see from the car how invasives work. Garlic mustard advances along the edges of forests everywhere. And from there, it penetrates into otherwise continuous plant communities. Another important tool in restoration is prescribed fires. Historically, Native Americans relied on fire to maintain grassland and open woodland or savannas. Here, buffaloes used to roam. Today, preserve management has reintroduced this practice. The prairie has become spectacular with the use of prescribed fi pre fires and the woodlands and edges savannas are also being restored with fire. Oak trees are adapted to withstand the fires with their thick bark and their deep indents protecting the live wood. Finally, my last slide of restoration. Here is an example of adaptive management which follows this sequence. Plan, do, check, act, and adapt. We all know that. So once this area was flooded, this is the entrance of Picnic Point, right after you go through the gate. And after every rain, rain this area was flooded on this heavily used past to Picnic Point. So the plan was to divert the water and to establish a rain garden. The preserve staff prepared the ground drawings, selected plants, and then engaged the friends volunteers. Planting day has come. It was a splendid day, a fun day. The staff checked the functioning of the rain garden later in the summer. You can see the cardinal flowers, the red flowers, growing beautifully and there's water collecting the rain. And then the staff adapted and managed the species in the rain garden over several years. And now this place is a favorite stop on field trips right at the entrance to observe plants and pollinators. There are many different bees on these golden rods. So what's in the future? Well, the new master plan Documents have a way of adding permanency, and it is important to have this plan in place before a new chancellor comes to the university in fall to preempt the danger of land grab for another building project. So become involved locally, volunteer in groups, contribute financially. Chancellor Blank, Rebecca Blank, is a member of the Friends of the Preserve, and she appreciates its existence. So I will leave uh, the uh, show, and uh, now we can come to our questions, and I hope I can answer most of them. 
<laughs> well, we have a couple waiting for you. Um, uh, someone asks, are there other success stories like the Lakeshore Nature Preserve in the Madison area? Or are there other candidates for such preservation in our area? Well, certainly success stories, the Pheasant Branch uh, Conservancy uh, that you have heard about in Middleton is a real success story. Volunteers there work with the county uh, directly to restore this land and uh, have restored it beautifully. Uh, there are numerous French organizations, Starkweather uh, Conservancy, the Friends of Lake Winger, they're sprouting up all over to help um, uh, conserve the land and uh, really advocate for it. It really does need the community to advocate for land preservation. For example, if something would happen here at the university and there have been attempts to build buildings, take you know, this, <laughs> there are more and more buildings and uh, the campus is being filled up. So why should one third of the property not be developed? Why don't we just take a little bit of it? And uh, this is where people like the Friends come in, representing the community who could advocate and mobilize the entire community to support uh, the preserve management who certainly want to keep the land in their efforts to keep it safe. Uh, there's not much money for uh, supporting a preserve like this. For example, uh, much, uh, probably a third of the budget for the preserve management comes from gifts monies. Uh, the uh, university does not supply enough money to, uh, to uh, manage this land. Plus uh, the volunteer work is an incredible uh, resource. Uh, preserve management probably uh, gathers up to a thousand hours of volunteer work annually through community groups, you know, like church groups and um, companies and uh, ROTC groups and campus uh, groups. And, uh, and then also the friends provide another $800 as hours. That together is probably $150,000 of work uh, provided for free. So uh, without the community, I think uh, it wouldn't be as good for, for all these lands. And especially here in Madison, we have many organizations. Even the, uh, um, uh, great, uh, the Great Lake, the Lake Alliance, you know, the Clean Lake Alliance and all these kinds of organizations, uh, kinds of organizations, Groundswell, many, 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 Audubon, Madison Audubon are supporting and conserving land. Has that been a constant uh, battle to keep development from <laughs> taking over portions <laughs> of, the uh, of the preserve? Yes. Oh, well, yes, yes. And uh, somewhat we have had some successes. For example, it was very important that Bill Conan at that time defined the natural areas that is a really wishy-washy term at the Lakeshore Nature Preserve. It gave it a place and a boundary and he drew that boundary. So that boundary is there now. And some of lot 60, if you know where that is, has been converted into a rain garden. Uh, there's also a hidden parking lot that somehow crept up along the Lakeshore Pass to the Union lot 34. And that is going to be converted back into um, natural land. Hmm. Um, the, uh, it really became an issue and the community became aware again in recent times when the social science building at the Carillion Tower on top where Baskin Hall is, was built, all of a sudden there it was on what we thought was natural lecture land. Hmm. And uh, so that's when Limnology decided to build their building at the end of the Lakeshore Path right next to Memorial Union and the Hofers Club. There's this strange terminology building, but they felt they were a real stop <laughs> because the road ends there. And, uh, and from there on, it's only walkers and bikers. So and it's always a fight. Uh, once the alumni union, uh, alumni association wanted to build a, why not, a condo for, I think for, 
for good donors <laughs> somewhere <laughs> in the preserve. So there are always attempts, you never know. Another question in the chat asks, um, are there ways that Bethel could use the preserve? Uh, yes, it, uh, it's not very far. Uh, we could uh, take a walk along the lakeshore, for example, uh, you know, with a group, or let's say uh, somebody suggests I give a field trip in the preserve. And uh, there are so many different kinds of field trips about the history, which is amazingly interesting. And uh, it's really a cultural resource too, that is being preserved more and more. And uh, about the various living things in the preserve. Uh, the other community, you know, like the Unitarian Church has uh, um, some volunteers that go into nature and they work at the preserve at times. Other churches do that too. And they don't have to work in the leisure preserve, but in other preserves as a group of volunteers, which is always a fun thing to do. Of course, we have Bethel Horizons yeah. and we can do a lot of work there as a group uh, for caring for creation, for sure. Are there other cities uh, that come to the preserve based on all your history and all the work that's been done there and all the changes to learn how to organize and establish similar areas in their cities? Well, I think that's a really good question. And uh, we can always think, you no, know, there are two answers to this, that if we bring people close to nature, like students who give, go to this campus here and experience this kind of a uh, possibility to have a freshman gathering at picnic point in the evening at that fire circle there. Beautiful, no, this is a bonding experience or to, to run in the morning along the lakeshore all the way to picnic point and back again before their classes. Uh, that when they move away and live in other cities that they will carry these memories and hopefully uh, commit to action and support efforts there to, to mm -hmm. keep nature. So that's one important function and uh, we should never forget that, that we serve the world. Uh, the, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, I think, I, I, I think we'll go on to another one. So there's several other questions here. Yes. One is about uh, many Americans believe that government regulations are bad and that the unfettered marketplace will lead to the best possible outcomes. So how effectively can natural places be preserved and restored without government action to limit development? Well, some things just don't happen without government action. Uh, you know, like the street cleaning and things like that. And uh, I think, uh, I used that example of the developer, how hard it really is. Uh, you know, people mean well, but they are under pressure. And then what do you do? So it, it takes a person like Aldo Leopold, who, <laughs> uh, but there are not many like that. Mm -hmm. So to really stand up for their beliefs and uh, take that action. I think there's someone called Randall Berry. You might have heard about them, who yes. is a strong environmentalist and has or Rachel Carlson at the time mm -hmm. really alerted uh, our nation to the fact that we've got to preserve some things. Or, you know, if you, if you touch that emotion of people, think about the monarch plight. The, uh, when uh, the monarchs had trouble, uh, the monarch butterflies, because there wasn't enough milkweed anymore. You know, it was in places, but they have to stop on the way north. They can't just fly all the way. So they, the land was too fragmented. The fields were too manicured. There was no longer just that strip between the road and the fields that had natural vegetation. It's all grass now and maintained. Uh, so there was no place for monarchs to stop anymore. And now people are sowing uh, milkweed seeds everywhere. And there are lots of monarchs in the Biocorp Prairie. So uh, it, does, it does work when people take action. And, uh, but it, we need to uh, really educate people through these, not just books, but bringing them into nature to make them love it. 
so that they really want to stand up for it. Most environmentalists have beautiful childhood experiences they can point to, you know, the ones that really work for the environment. And, uh, and that's what we have to provide too. And we can also do it with adults. And I think volunteer work is a real way towards that because you do and you learn. You need to know what garlic busset looks like before you can pull it. So, yes. and then you become more interested in all these things. So it's very important to uh, learn by doing. And more than just one quick acquaintance too. I think it, you need to- Immersion, yes. And again and again, yes. Right. Yes, yes. You remember that when you go back to a childhood place and that tree is gone or the lake is filled or something is covered with asphalt, it, you know, you feel that loss. You did love that place. You didn't want that to happen. Do you have any advice for people who want to help care for the environment or we could say the preserve specifically, but aren't quite sure where to start? I think it always starts with volunteering or with just going there. Uh, you know, for John and me, it started by just taking walks and getting acquainted and taking the same walk again and again. These 160,000 people that went through the entrance are not always different people. People come again and again. And uh, eventually there is a turning point. You know, they might be interested in participating in a field trip and really getting to what's the name of this flower. And once you name a thing, uh, you feel more connected too. You know, if it's just a bird, it's a bird, it's a bird. But if you know it's a robin, uh, you, you can talk to that robin. You feel connected. Mm -hmm. you know, in naming things and being able to do that is important and it's easiest in nature itself. And then you might be motivated to participate in volunteer work. Mm -hmm. Another person wants to know, are there linkages with Governor Nelson State Park? in terms of shoreline preservation and recreation, or also with large prairie and open woodlands there? With doing what there? Uh, Are there linkages with the-, with no, the no, this is the state park. State parks have been in trouble for, I know that from Devil's Lake State Park, uh, because I think under the Walker government, all state parks uh, were cut off from any resources, government resources. So uh, this was really, really serious and uh, a lot of damage. You know, a lot of people go to these parks and there is damage. It always takes maintenance. And uh, so in Governor Nelson State Park, the same, but in Devil's Lake uh, State Park, that was really bad. And all these invasives took root. So now the friends of these parks, I'm sure there's, there's a Governor Nelson Friends Group too. Uh, try to act and do something for these parks and hopefully there will be more money in the future for them. Um, are there any ongoing relationships with Ho-Chunk today uh, in terms of uh, their ongoing interest in the land itself? Yes, all the restoration efforts in the preserve that regard uh, mounds and the uh, former village areas, we, we know where these areas are, uh, are now done in collaboration with the Ho-Chunk Nation. So uh, the university in particular has investigated every piece of land before they build anything, change anything. They know whether there are any um, possible village remnants or other remains. The uh, uh, Friends of the Lakeshore Preserve have our, their annual meeting uh, in April and our speaker is Janice Rice. She is a Ho-Chunk oh. and she will talk, she, uh, her ancestral land is here in Southern Wisconsin and she will talk about the Ho-Chunk nation. She works at the university in the library and is a wonderful speaker. So I invite you to come to the Arboretum on April 6th and uh, I can send out this email and uh, it is free and open to the public and she will be the speaker. So we all make an effort to, at this point in time, you know, to uh, connect with uh, uh, Native American groups, indigenous groups who 
who really feel this is their ancestral land. Certainly, it is. Um, we are <laughs> pushing the, the limit here in terms of our time. I want to just mention two other things. Uh, Laura Wyatt has, has put in the chat, the friends offer monthly guided walks or field trips, which are a great way to get acquainted with the land. And Betty Pullman asks if we could show the map again to show us where the entrance is to the preserve. Um, I don't know if you can do that now, or we can just ask them to go to the recording of this uh, uh, webinar and they would see it there too. Yeah, well, let me just uh, quickly do this. I think this is certainly possible. Uh, let's see, I'm at the end here. Gosh, I should have gone. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> Now you see the show backward, that's <laughs> good too, but uh, it's too long. The, the, well here, the picnic point interest is right at this point. Uh, so here's University Bay Drive. You know, this is the old map, but it's still the same. And this University Bay Drive goes to the hospitals and uh, there's a show at Hills and uh, picnic point is here. There's a big parking lot right here. So during the week, uh, you have to pay a little money to park there uh, so that university employees don't just park there for free. But after 4.30, it's free and also uh, all weekend long. So you're directly in the preserve and you can go all these different places. Uh, is that clear enough if showing this map or should I go further back? <laughs> It's really too far, gosh. I We're should have there. done. I'm getting there, yes. Oh, there's the, there's the kiosk. So this is the entrance. And uh, it's by that big, beautiful wall, which was built by one of the owners in the 1930s, I believe. Uh, for his wife, he built this big wall there. Interesting story. So here you see the preserve map. And now we are getting to the preserve, all these beautiful things you can see, not every day, but uh, during the seasons. And when you look hard. Beautiful, beautiful. And this beautiful view that is just from halfway up to picnic point. See, these views are just gorgeous and they used to be covered by buckthorn. So here's the map. There you go. <laughs> right, and uh, the blue dot is the parking lot. The blue dot straight in the middle. So you get there, see the university houses uh, and University Avenue is just along the bottom of this map. It shows up a little bit here. So I don't know how you get there easiest. I think uh, just uh, Google it on your map, but uh, this is the class of 18 Marsh that I talked about. You have the entrance, you have the big wall, the walk to picnic point. And uh, up the hill here, this is hilly, you go up to the Biocor Prairie. There are these old fields, you see them outlined, it's still like a square. And there are also the Eagle Heights Community Gardens. The students that live here can have their gardens here, uh, 300 gardens with uh, vegetation uh, raising uh, methods from, I think, 100 countries. And uh, Eagle Heights Woods is way on the back here. There are eagles now that don't live there, but they certainly come here in fall and in winter. And uh, you see them all along the shoreline now. I think we're gonna to have to let the rest of the geography <laughs> be up to people Googling that as was suggested before. And thank you, thank you, thank you Gisela for what was a gorgeous look an accessible natural space, a wonderful learning experience, uh, and for showing us our connectedness to uh, this natural space, reminding us about our responsibilities uh, to love and respect nature, and giving us so many reasons to visit the preserve ourselves. So well, thank you well, very much. Well, thank you for listening. It was a pleasure. And thank you all for um, uh, attending uh, tonight. 
Uh, we hope to see you again on April 12th for our next webinar when Professor Randy Jackson, UW Professor of Grassland Ecology, is going to explain to us the fundamental importance of the dirt we walk on <laughs> and the role regenerative agriculture has in helping to stabilize the climate, clean our waters, reduce flooding, and support bio biodiversity. So hope to see you then. Thank you.